thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me here uh, today to speak about my project, uh, Modern Architecture, Planetary Warming and Environmental Decline. So speaking of a great fail, I think it's already obvious in which direction I'm, uh, <clears throat> I'm heading. So I'm Hans Ebelings and uh, I am originally from Amsterdam, but today I came from, um, this time from Montreal. And uh, today's lecture comes with an estimated increase of my carbon footprint with circa 1,100 kilos of CO2, which is approximately 15 times my weight. Um, the average uh, annual carbon footprint per person is 40, uh, 4,800 kilos. In other words, with this evening, I'm taking up 23% of that. The good news is that I haven't flown all the way from Montreal only for this lecture. The bad news is that my trip is emitting, emitting even more because after this lecture, I go to Barcelona and Belgrade. So it means that I will add another 3,500 kilo of carbon emissions to my footprint. Uh, so my presence here is a clear case of cognitive dissonance, particularly given that I'm here to speak about architecture's conundrum, that while building is usually motivated by a sincere desire to make a better world, it's almost without exception harming the planet. And this is the central theme of my upcoming book, Modern Architecture, A Planetary Warming History, which will come out either at the end of this year or possibly the beginning of next. If it comes out this year, uh, it's recycled paper production, transportation, printing, binding, and international distribution will bring an estimated additional 2,200 kilos of CO2 into the atmosphere, bringing my total only by one lecture uh, and uh, one publication at 5,700 kilos, which is 900 kilos above the average of 4,800. So, having said this, the book is a tentative alternative history uh, of modern architecture, presenting other projects and other people and other perspectives on well-known projects as well. So those two sides, it's kind of other projects and other perspective on well-known ones. And the story that I'm telling in this book and the story that I'm telling today is neither a tight and conclusive narrative, nor a systemic overview. The lack of a greater clarity uh, seems unavoidable at this moment, given the over-ambitious uh, wish to break away from the established neural networks of the profession's collective memory of how modern, arch modern architecture's history has unfolded. And without any false modesty, I see this as the beginning of a rewiring of introducing new actors, ideas, and projects that deal with climate and environment while relegating some of the usual stars, scenes, and highlights of modernism and postmodernism to the background. Uh, where are we? So, as an architectural historian and critic, I have to admit I suffer from another cognitive dissonance as well. Are we too far? Wait a second. How do I go back? Um, I know that deep in my heart, building and buildings are bad for the environment, but I cannot help myself and admire all the great architecture, and I have been writing about this architecture in glowing reviews without being bothered by their environmental consequences. Last year, Michael Rolson published The Nature of Tomorrow, A History of the Environmental Future which is a beautiful book, which describes how our expectations about the future have infor are informing uh, the present. And he dryly notes somewhere in the book that, and it's a quote, human expansion is built into the Western vision of the future and has been for a long time. And these words will probably resonate with anyone who is even superficially aware of the collective mindset uh, of the world of architecture. In architecture, expansion is the default answer to any programmatic, spatial, societal, or other issue. And the usual solution is to add square meters and cubic meters. Or to knock something down to replace it by something that's newer, larger, and better. 
as Rawson puts it, and this is again a quote, the history of environmental dreaming speaks directly to the root of the current environmental predicament, the widespread rejection of natural limits. Although the idea of progress has lost much of its luster since the 1960s, the alluring vision of endless material abundance for an endless number of people lives on, with production, consumption, and population continuing to grow on a planet that does not. And he ends with, the failure to resolve that paradox begins to look like an extraordinary inability to reconcile memory and expectations with the environmental realities, end of quote. It is this failure to recognize the impossibility of our belief in growth and progress and its derivative that growth is equal to progress. And if you allow me a generalization, I think we are all victims and perpetrators of this way of thinking, and hence we all suffer from its underlying cognitive dissonance. Most people in our world of architecture evidently prefer to neglect or deny how bad building is or pretend to solve it by producing something that's greener, uh, like you see here with this Bosco Verticale. Growth and progress as articles of faith have a longer history as Rawson shows in his book, but they really became a doctrine during the Industrial Revolution. Which brings me to the point of departure of my book. Modern architecture is inseparably linked with the Industrial Revolution. In almost every history, almost to leave room for the unknown, the emergence of modern architecture is tied to European industrialization in the 19th century. Industrially manufactured materials such as iron, steel, reinforced concrete, glass, asbestos, and later plastics have made architecture modern. The Industrial Revolution also set planetary warming in motion. It led to a large-scale resource depletion and it caused an unprecedented environmental decline, not only in Europe, but also in large parts of the world where, which were colonized by European states. And the exploitation of land, resources, and labor in and from colonies has been indispensable for this growth and progress of the Industrial Revolution. If the Industrial Revolution was the unique first moment in this human-induced planetary warming, the Great Acceleration, beginning after the Second World War, was its seismic se sequel. It saw the rapid increase of basically everything, car ownership, deforestation, ecological footprints, economic prosperity, education levels, energy use, extinction of animal and plant species, fossil fuel consumption, healthcare, industrial output, intensive agriculture, life expectancy, meat consumption, mobility, pollution of water, land and air, population growth, tourism, urbanization, use of natural resources, waste, and much more, including an acceleration of planetary warming, to which almost all other accelerations have contributed. The Great Acceleration is a global phenomenon, but Europe, the US and Canada, and Australia always have had an outsized share in it, treating the planet's resources in a manner similar to how European colonizers have been treating the world since they discovered it as a terra nullius, a concept that the land, the water, the air, and all living organisms are there for the taking, at no cost, with no concern, about environmental externalities. From the perspective of historians of the built and destroyed environments, among the many improvements of modern life in the era of the Great Acceleration, two stand out, the car and the air conditioner. Enabling extreme mobility, uh, individual mobility, and climate control of uh, interior spaces, together they allowed for a planetary urbanization to use the term coined by Neil Brenner and Christian Schmidt. Aside from the primary environmental impact related to the production, use, and disposal of cars and air conditioners, 
The secondary effect is that people can live almost everywhere. Distance and climate cease to be obstacles for development, which underlines a point made by James Marston Fitch, albeit with a different point of departure, in the preface to American Building the Environmental Forces that Shape It, which was published in 1972. It was the second edition of the book that was originally published in the 1940s um, and reworked into two separate editions. After Riley noting that the 1948 edition had made zero impact, he mentioned that, if anything, the interest in ecological, microclimatic, and psychosomatic aspects of architecture had actually diminished between the 1940s and 1972, uh, which he attributed to the availability of technology, technology that disincentivizes more sustainable forms of architecture and urban planning. Now I'm quoting uh, Fitch. This failure to achieve experientially acceptable levels of performance takes place at the center of the world's most developed technologies. It might almost be said that the failure is made possible precisely by the overwhelming presence of that technology. So this is, I think, an important point. If we speak about failure, that is a failure made possible by technology. Seen through Fitch's eyes, present urbanization can be seen as a failure to make, uh, made possible by technology. And I always think that uh, the urbanization of a place like Phoenix is a great example of uh, a failure made possible by technology. And I also like this kind of visual analogy here between the curve in the road and the curve in the uh, graph. Um, something similar is true for the so-called Green Revolution, which is another example of failure uh, due to technology. Uh, it's the misleading team term for the technolo technological advancements in agricultural practices, which rely on high yield crops, scale increases, energy intensive mechanization, chemical pesticides and fertilizers, and extensive irrigation. These are all factors contributing to environmental uh, deterioration and the decline in biodiversity. Yet, the monocultures of the Green Revolution have undeniably brought food security to hundreds of millions of individual humans. And it underlines, again, this conundrum, same conundrum as the conundrum of architecture, that what's good for humans is often detrimental for the Earth. Similarly, the increased life expectancy brought by medical progress and improved hygiene is good for individuals, but bad for the planet. The average life expectancy of humans went up from with four years in the 19th century to 32. In the 20th century, it more than doubled to 66. Whereas humans have prolonged their lives since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, the lifespan of most of what surrounds us has gotten shorter. Technical improvements have made many consumption goods objectively better than before, but the perpetual innovation has created a vicious circle of demand for new and better products. Who has a phone that's older than four years? Um, and correspondingly, a relentless plant obsolescence. As Daniel Abramson has made clear in Obsolescence, an architectural history, great book, buildings expandability began with an accounting formula invented in the late 19th century to get consensus about the value of real estate. This formula was based on the assumption that the building depreciates to a value of zero over 40 years. And this axiomatic point of departure and the reasoning that follows from it have led to the misguided idea that knocking down a building after 40 years doesn't destroy any value, only a building. Once the principle of a building's financial mortality was sufficiently embedded in the mindset of everyone in the building industry, it became conventional wisdom to design and construct buildings not meant to last more than 40 years. And whether it's causally correlated or not, it was not just the lifespan of buildings that 
became shorter in this period, but also the lifespan of architectural styles and movements. Deeply embedded in this abundance and obsolescence is the dictum which fully emerged during the Industrial Revolution that growth equals progress. But it has become clear since then that progress of humanity has resulted in unparalleled uh, environmental deterioration of the planet. And that uncontained growth is unsustainable. And it leads to what Thomas Hiland Erickson, referencing Gregory Bateson, has aptly called overheating, runaway processes of more and bigger, which also affects architecture, cities, landscapes, and infrastructural mega projects. So in brief, this is what uh, motivated me to write my book, which I like to describe in a manner of Ray and Charles Eames calling their first version of Powers of Ten a rough sketch for a proposed film. So I see my book as a rough sketch for a proposed history of planetary warming, in which, as I mentioned at the beginning, I try to blend two different stories. I revisit highlights of modern architecture and see them through a planetary warming lens, and I've used a broad definition of architecture and planning, which includes mega projects of geoengineering that reflect a similar ethos and confidence in humanity's technological prowess, prowess as modern architecture. And the other story turns away from this modern narrative of growth and progress um, towards projects and ideas of architects, planners, and artists whose work is informed by issues related to climate, ecology, biology, nature, the environment, and the planet. And these designers and their projects have been treated cursorily, if at all, in traditional histories. And to write them into history requires a kind of historiographical turn, admittedly a pompous expression. And in this turn, the world of architecture is no longer seen as a, as a pyramid, an environment dominated by a few big predators, but as a more extensive, diverse, and web-like -like architectural ecosystem uh, of creatures, great and small. So to give you an idea of what I'm doing in this book, uh, I want to uh, illustrate it with a few uh, projects. So a clear case of rereading a modern highlight is uh, it's possible with the Crystal Palace, uh, designed by Joseph Paxton, uh, built in London's Hyde Park, and it's in many ways the ideal beginning of a modern architectural history. And this building has been used a lot, and I guess that most of you are familiar with it as a modern highlight. Uh, designed and built for the great exhibition of the works of industry of all nations, which, held in 1851, was an industrial imperial event that underlined British economic and political power. Aside from being large, memorable, and well-documented, the Crystal Palace is a perfect illustration of the connection between industry and modernity. It is constructed of prefabricated modular elements of iron and glass and lacks any overt reference to historical styles and typologies, aside from those of greenhouses in, which, uh, in whose development Paxton himself had played a significant role. In architectural terms, greenhouses are minimal buildings, basically nothing but a construction to carry a glazed envelope, yet they maximize the difference between interior and exterior climates. A climate concern was crucial in the Crystal Palace. As you can see in this middle illustration, uh, Paxton wanted to create an environment that was explicitly protective and would protect visitors and the exhibits from London's foul air. To avoid high temperatures and high humidity that were typically sought for in greenhouses, Paxton created this inventive, albeit imperfect, ventilation system making the Crystal Palace arguably an early example of climate-controlled architecture. Paxton also adjusted the design to preserve three Dutch elms that were standing on the building site in Hyde Park. And that's one of the trees you can see on the image on the right. 
an indication of what can be considered in retrospect as an environmentalist awareness. Another aspect of this project's sustainability is the reuse of the iron and glass components for a differently shaped second crystal palace in South London, making, in a way, Paxton one of the first modern recyclers. And this second crystal palace, completed in 1854, lasted until it was destroyed by fire in 1936. It was situated in a large park, part of which was and still is populated by life-sized models of dinosaurs. These were sculpted by Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins based on advice of biologist Richard Owen, whose reputation was not yet tainted by his eventual hostility against Charles Darwin's ideas about evolution. In 1841, Owen, his biologist, had coined the name terrible lizards uh, for this group of prehistoric animals. And the sculptures of these extinct reptiles were placed near or on top large rocks from different parts of Great Britain, corresponding with the sediments in which their fossilized uh, remains had been found. In this way, it helped to instill a sense of what much later became known as deep time. The second Crystal Palace and the Dinosaur Park juxtaposed architecture's radical modernity with an evocation of deep time, while hinting at the deep time origin of the modern materials iron and glass in iron ore, coal, coke, uh, silica, sand, sodium oxide, uh, calcium oxide, uh, dolomite, and feldspar. And seen in this way, the subtle message of this juxtaposition was that no matter how modern a building, it cannot escape its geological and natural origins. The next example is Le Corbusier's Esprit Nouveau Pavilion, uh, built in 1925 uh, for the Exposition Internationale des Arts Décoratifs et Industriels Modernes, which was both an exhibition building and an exhibit in itself. One part which you can see on the left slide, this rotunda, this drum um, at the far end, contained um, an exhibition, a display of two large urban plans of Le Corbusier, the city of for three million inhabitants and the Plan Voisin. The other part was a one-to-one -one model of a unit of the Immeuble Villa, which was an early iteration of what Le Corbusier liked to call a vertical garden city. And this prototype, or model dwelling, is a paradox, um, because one of its most attractive aspects was this big tree in the loggia, uh, which is there only because Le Corbusier was not allowed to cut it down. It was a pre-existing tree. And obviously, a tree of this size could not be integrated in an apartment building, because roots and canopy would take up the loggias of the downstairs and upstairs neighbors, respectively. On black and white images, this tree looks like a beach, a common tree in Paris. The interesting thing is that if the tree is mentioned at all in history books, it's always just like that, as a tree, in line with how Le Corbusier inscribed it in plans for this project. On his ground floor plan, a small circle indicates the position of the tree's trunk with the clinical and dry text, Arbre à conserver, tree, to be preserved. Equally aloof is how the large circle in the roof plan is simply an ouverture pour passage de l'arbre, an opening for the passage of the tree. And Le Corbusier didn't bother to mention anything about the tree, nor did any historian uh, or critic uh, since. And this clear lack of interest for what seems to be the most prominent uh, feature in this project is uh, I think quite telling. Nature is of a kind of secondary importance in the case of the work of Le Corbusier. Ludwig Mies van der Rohe and Lili Reich. Planters and water lilies are not the first elements that come to mind, but they were integral to the original German pavilion, as you can see from this rare image uh, from a higher point of view, you can see that in the pond there are water lilies. 
And I think, well, you cannot see them here, but there were planters close to the uh, glass facade of the building. The building of Ludwig Misch van der Rohe and Lili Reich was demolished in 1930 after the end of the international exhibition for which it was built. And the design, but not the 1929 building, the design has been reconstructed in the 1980s by Ignacio de Sola Morales, Christian Chirici, and uh, Fernando Ramos, but without the vegetation. It has taken until 2022 before the water lilies returned to the pond in an intervention by the Warsaw office of Centrala. Um, and as it turned out, the shallower depth of the reconstructed pond is not helpful to spur the growth of the lilies, neither is the planetary warming. It's much warmer now in Barcelona. And um, I've looked at the lilies in the middle of the summer and it was really uh, heartbreaking to see how they were suffering. So I'm going back to Barcelona now. Hopefully they have improved just a tiny little bit. But at one point during uh, the summer of 1929, most of the pond was covered with those lilies. The original presence of the lilies within the confinement of the rectangular pool uh, must have created a contrast of nature, abstract nature, uh, and architecture, comparable to what happened inside in the second wet patio, where there was a classical sculpture of Georg Kolbe, uh, which did and does evoke a duality between the classical and the modern. So I think those two oppositions, the classical and the modern, with the sculpture of Kolbe and uh, architecture and nature uh, with the pond with the lilies was extremely important. The pots with plants which stood directly in front of the facade have not been brought back yet, but I think there is a chance that they will return. And they are perhaps harder to reconcile with the abstract architecture of the pavilion. The plants may come across as either an ornamental furnishing or a disturbance of the perfection of the architectural composition. However, it fits Mies van der Rohe's idea of harmony between the cultural world of architecture and the natural world of plants, which was never about an organic merger of building and site or architecture and natural features, because typically all the architectural projects of Mies with or without Lili Reich detach themselves from the ground as a way to underline how this architecture distances itself from its environment, whether it's natural or urban in character. And potted plants, as well as lilies in the rectangular pond, also establish clear distance between architecture and the nature. Another example, which I consider one of the finds in this book, because uh, I don't think there's any other general history of architecture that includes this project by Grupo Austral, a rural housing competition from 1939 in Argentina. This competition entry was designed by the avant-garde group of architects in Argentina, reflecting their explicit interest in climate as a design consideration. Austral was started by Antonio Bonet, an architect from Barcelona, uh, Juan Courchan and Jorge, Jorge Ferrari Hardoy. Uh, were best known for their joint uh, BKF butterfly chair. You all know this beautiful butterfly chair from 1938. With the group's name, they obviously situated themselves as part of the Southern Hemisphere. That's Austral is Southern Hemisphere, obviously. Published in 1939, in the second part of the group's manifesto, uh, which was published in a magazine called Revista Nuestra Arquitectura, uh, Austral's proposal for this housing design competition, which was sponsored by the Banco de la Nación Argentina, uh, was a rural architecture that showed a direct link with Le Corbusier's radiant village and farm project, which I also have in my book, by the way, uh, of which Austral's founding partners were aware because they had been working for Le Corbusier around the time that this radiant farm and radiant village were uh, in the making earlier that decade. And what makes this project particularly interesting are the diagrams that you see at the bottom of the page. 
Um, what they did, instead of developing one prototype as was the brief, they came up with four different uh, versions. As you can see here, we have the two others. And what you can see is that going from the north where it's warm to the south where it's cold, you can see that the house is getting more dense and contracted. So the one in the north uh, has this kind of open space below, having pilotis if you want, if you want to think that it's coming from Le Corbusier, to have this breezy ventilated space with shade under the building. Then the one for the northern part of the moderate climate is uh, still very open. And you can see that the final version at the, uh, for the south is this extremely dense house organized around the fireplace. So by making something like that, you can see that there is, in a very early stage, interest and concern about climate. And what's really striking is that this outside uh, the Western context of Western European North American architecture, which dominates most architectural histories. And it coincided with the work of another architect in uh, Argentina, uh, Vladimiro Acosta, who was developing a kind of shading system, uh, which he uh, called Helios, um, which was also really advanced. So I have 240 more examples. So if you have a bit of patience, I'm more than happy to speak for another four hours, but that's maybe unsustainably long. So um, I'm going to speed it up a little bit. I'm going to show you some images while I'm speaking, and I hope that uh, even though they don't really match, that you can uh, see what's going on. Whereas most of the book stays within the confines of history of modern architecture, even if I'm introducing other forms of modern architecture than you usually see, um, two chapters are really different, I believe. One of them deals with what I see as an increase of planetary awareness, and here are two examples. Uh, I'm not going to uh, explain them. Uh, an increase of planetary awareness throughout this modern period, an awareness of the totality of the planet and a more intimate relation with the crust of the Earth and eventually also the biosphere. Well, one little word about this one, a Dutch design made in the final years, uh, final winter of uh, the Second World War for uh, a scientific center 15 miles into the earth. And what's really funny is that uh, what's usually called the mantle is called the coat here, which is the kind of wrong translation from the Dutch, which is also mantle, uh, thinking that it should be coat in English, but that's because it's dictionary was maybe too limited. Uh, but anyway, this idea to go into the earth with a project which was also called Plan the Impossible. So this intimate relation with the crust is uh, the, this link with the surface of the earth is uh, much more important, I realized, than I have been aware of. And for instance here, to say another kind of little detour, uh, architecture without architects, which is always interpreted, I think, and seen as a, as a pamphlet, as a manifesto for architecture that is not built by, I would say, people like you, uh, with a training in architecture, but by the people themselves. Um, but it's really striking that, especially the beginning part of the book, underlines the importance of the connection with the land. And uh, Rudowski explicitly writes, it starts with projects like these, which are more carvings into the landscape than buildings in, in a conventional sense. And then it moves on to underground building, cave buildings, uh, all kinds of forms of architecture which are really part of the, the crust of the earth. And he writes that the quality of this architecture without architects often seems to uh, reside in exactly this quality, to be part of the land. Um, the other line, uh, the other chapter which I think is different, so one is the, the dealing with basically the crust of the earth, 
uh, in which the mountains played an important role as well. The other is addressing the technosphere and showing the increased use and abuse of the planet with what I like to call geoengineering in this context, which is in its limited sense related to uh, tinkering with uh, the weather and creating clouds. But I think the name itself already, geoengineering, uh, allows you to have a much broader interpretation as well, so that all the mega projects that have been taking place since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution could be treated uh, as architecture, even if they're too large to be seen as an architectural project. They're made and motivated by the same conviction uh, that human ingenuity can transform and control the totality of the natural and the built and the destroyed environments. The idea is to dam off seas, to build lakes, to reclaim land, to mine, to build continents spanning highways, huge canals, highways or recreational trails like the Appalachian Trail, which is something like 2,000 kilometers which you can walk if you want. Um, and also the kind of extreme ideas from the 1950s and 60s to blast harbors using nuclear explosions. Uh, this is a plan on the left to dam off the Mediterranean. Um, and here this plan to dam the Bering Strait to uh, ensure that uh, the North Pole would melt. We now know we don't need a dam to do that. Um, two Canadian projects, Trans-Canada Highway, similar to the Span-American Highway, and one of the largest infrastructural wor works in the world, which nobody knows, which I didn't even know um, the first years. I was living, was living in Montreal, the St. Lawrence Seaway. Um, and here, two of the most uh, horrifying projects that I have included in my book. Uh, one plan to celebrate that Alaska was joining the United States and to celebrate it, there was this idea to build a harbor. And in the late 1950s, Mao started in China his war against nature and the destruction, uh, eradication of these four species was part of the strategy. And the thinking that you can destroy nature, uh, that you can win a war against nature, I think is very typical for a thinking, way of thinking that is very much embedded in the um, modern era, including this uh, plans to remake nature on an extremely large scale by making a Pleistocene landscape or continuing to destroy the surface of the earth. This is from Germany, where they have extremely green ambitions, but at the same time, one of the largest brown coal mines in the world. Um, and the terrifying dream, this nightmare, that possibly humans will repeat all this same while well, terraforming Mars. Writing the book was intellectually exciting and emotionally draining, I have to say, and sometimes really scary. It has helped me, though, to develop a different perspective, which not only allowed me to see familiar architecture in a different way, but also to discover many projects, people and ideas that I haven't been able to appreciate before, including the work of John Ruskin. I believe that's valuable for me, just as it helped me to see the totality of the world of architecture in a different way. Innovations come with um, creative destruction, according to economist Joseph Schumpeter. And this idea is obviously another example of this growth and progress thinking. Architectural innovation often comes with creative destruction as well. Yet, from a planetary warming in perspective, I can no longer unsee that building activities, whether they are innovative or not, also come with the corollary. Uh, of creative destruction, and that until now, architecture has 
almost always been a force of destructive creativity. To end on a slightly more positive note, I sh in the footstep of great utopian visionaries like Wenzel Hablik, I just showed you one image of his work, I believe that in this digital age, it's possible to conjure another kind of architecture, an architecture that is uh, of this planet, but not bound to planet's gravity. An architecture that imagines, imagines space uh, and is shaping place, but with a minimal ecological impact that creates environments that are not required to follow the logics or laws which constrain architecture in the real world. A multi-dimensional architecture of generative uh, creativity and a leap in an unparalleled world where architecture can be everything and anything. Thank you. You mentioned that uh, the Second World War was uh, an accelerator uh, for the industry. Uh, I'd like to ask you about uh, this uh, war in uh, Europe. I mean, Ukrainian war and crisis with the Russia, I mean, fuel and other things. Uh, in your opinion, what could we expect? Oh, that's a good one. Um, well, I think that the acceleration was actually after the war, but it was, of course, the war was crucial in it. Uh, and this whole effort of rebuilding Europe and rebuilding uh, Japan and uh, uh, kind of rebuilding economies led to this acceleration, this belief that we could grow out the, the problems of uh, the war. Um, I think what happens now, especially with energy, is that there's this growing awareness of the, the, the kind of problematic situation we've been in, not only because of the ties with the Russian gas, but also because of our dependency on fossil fuels. And uh, so I think if there is any silver lining to the war, it is at least that there's a, a serious thinking now about the future of energy more seriously than before. Um, but that's, I think, the only positive thing I could mention here. And I, um, I don't know, I think we're in this situation where the world is changing, power balance is changing, uh, and uh, even if Europe is maybe coming to their senses in terms of energy. Uh, it doesn't mean that the world in its totality will come to its senses, because there is more CO2 emissions than ever before, globally. And uh, there is this extreme inequality between what Europe has been doing since 1800 and what the rest of the world is doing. And. Uh, I don't know if there's any reason uh, to think that on the larger scale of things the war in Ukraine is changing the kind of trajectory we are on with global warming. Okay. Thank you. I guess I'm part of the house. I'm really curious. In doing your research about that modern architecture, I'm not an architect, by the way. <laughs> I'm into environmental philosophy. Uh, but uh, doing that research on modern architecture, can we found some uh, you know, good examples that would be more environmental friendly? Yes. Uh, I'm really yeah, no, so there are definitely uh, people uh, that developed an awareness of the destructive effects of architecture. One of them is uh, Malcolm Wells, an American architect, who had started his career building buildings until he realized how much land he had taken up by building his, or having his buildings uh, ex designs executed. Mm -hmm. And he decided that from then on he would only build underground. Mm -hmm. And of course, you're still destroying the environment. If you 
built underground. But at least he brought back the surface layer so that there was a kind of continuity of the landscape. And then, so what started on a relatively small scale, he designed his own office in uh, New Jersey uh, as an underground building, and then he designed some houses in which he also added means for passive uh, uh, solar energy. Uh, but then he dreamed up uh, uh, an underground shopping mall, an underground sports stadium, and eventually an underground airport, where all the buildings were underground, but the runways were not. So I think he, he went too far in that respect, but he, he's one example where there was this true and serious attempt to, uh, to do something about it. Um, there are other examples. But it's striking that many of the best examples are from outside architecture or in the periphery of architecture. So I think for this planetary awareness, uh, human geographers like Elysée Reclus was extremely important. And uh, I think he was one of the first that found a way to, to to really build out this, this planetary awareness in, in, a, in a way of living and a way of understanding the world. And for him, it was the... So he wrote a series of books about the planet uh, and uh, the relationship between humans and the planets. And he first came to the conclusion that there is... Uh, if you have a planetary view, there is no difference between people. Everyone's equal. So he developed a strong anarchist uh, philosophy. He was friends with uh, Kropotkin, uh, Patrick Geddes and others. There was this whole uh, anarchist circle. And then he expanded that and said, well, if it's for humans, then it's also for all the animals. And he became really like a forerunner of a, of a very inclusive perspective. And he tried to build, he tried to build large globes uh, at uh, world fairs, which were meant to instill this awareness of the planet. So he was a kind of a builder, but not really. Uh, and uh, there are maybe more, but it, it's a fairly small group of people that show this uh, concern and awareness. Um, but there are a few. So um, you mentioned that the building, the, the length of the building, the lifespan of the building is about 40 years right now, and, and it's got kind of ingrained in our mind. Mm -hmm. That's how the building should last. Um, and I guess the environmental pressures will be pushing us to extend it, right? Because mm -hmm. we don't want to, to use as much resources yeah. and so on. But how do you think that affects the psychology of the human being, because we still want the creativity, even in our own houses, right? How, how do you think, is that a conflict, and how can we resolve it? Or uh, is it possible to resolve it? I, well, I think so, uh, but it really depends on how we define this, this creativity. If it's about form making, uh, if you want to have a new, something new to look at. Uh, I think reshuffling your furniture in your living room can be very satisfying <laughs> as, a, as a kind of creative act uh, to, to see your own house in a different way. And I think if we move towards this kind of incremental change and growth much more and see the creativity in the reuse of what we already have, I think there are great examples of, uh, of inventive reuse. Um, and I think you could even claim that if we think there is this process of alienation in our modern societies, that everything changes so rapidly, then knowing that your house remains the same, that your home remains the same, is a very reassuring thought, I believe. So uh, we should get rid of this idea that new is better, and that better should be bigger. That's basically what I think, but I'm a historian, and uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm not, I don't have any insight in the kind of mass psychology of uh, uh, humanity. Um, and again, there is always cognitive dissonance whenever I'm saying something like this, because I want to make another book, I want to make a new book, 
I'm not making an old book. I would like to say thank you, Hans. My pleasure. Thank you very much.